God, we pray that you would speak to us, that you would open the eyes of our hearts to see what you have prepared for us today. Pray that you would help us to hear. We pray that through my words, through the scripture we have read, through the meditations of our hearts, we would hear you. In Jesus' name we pray, giving you thanks. Amen. In, in some ways, this passage that we read today is, is one of the most dangerous passages to read in a Protestant church because this particular passage has uh, been, um, th there's more controversy about this passage than any other part of all of Scripture, partly because the Catholic Church still uh, to this day um, uses the, the passage we read about on, Peter, on you I will build my church and giving him the keys to the kingdom. All of the pictures that you see, uh, the statues of Peter, he's holding two keys. One key is the authority over the earth, and the other key is the authority in heaven. And uh, the, the, the lineage of popes, they believe, started with, with Peter and continues to this day to the pope that we have now, Pope Francis. Um, and, you know, obviously most Protestants don't think that's exactly what this passage was had in mind, but there's been a lot of different interpretations of this. But I want to try to kind of connect this to what we talked about last week. What we talked about last week was that um, we, uh, that our emotions we think are caused by other people or by situations around us, but they're really not. They're caused by our own filters inside of us, what's going inside of our hearts. That's, that's what really gives us our emotions. Because let me give you an example of that, though. You imagine two people, uh, I, I've used this example before, but imagine two people look at a spider crawling across the floor. One of them screams and jumps up on top of the uh, cupboards in the kitchen. The other one starts looking very carefully at the spider and gets a big grin on his face because he, you know, that people can look at the same thing and have very different reactions depending on one person is deathly afraid of spiders and the other person is someone who studies spiders for a living. So they're going to have different reactions. It's because of what's in our hearts. It's not because of what's outside of us. When we feel angry, when we feel happy, all of those things are caused by what's going on inside of us and not what other people are doing or what is happening in the world. But that having been said, we may all be able to agree on that. That having been said, if we want to change those filters we have, if we want to change so that we react differently, how do we do that? And that's kind of what I want to look at today. We have to unlearn a lot of what we have learned about how to react, but, but how do we do that? It's very, very difficult for us to change ourselves. We try to, but mostly it's an outward change. Mostly our insides really haven't changed that much. We can choose to act differently, but what's happening inside of us may still really be mostly the same. So, and Jesus knows the, this, but he also knows that his public ministry is finished. The, the feeding of the 5,000 and the things that have happened in the last few chapters of Matthew, his public ministry is finished. He's taken the disciples away from Jewish territory and they've gone way up into the north. They've followed the Jordan River, river up to the, the place where it starts. And that's where Caesar, Caesarea Philippi is one of the um, major uh, springs that feeds into the um, Jordan River. And so in a sense, Jesus is kind of taking them on a retreat. We have to have a little leadership retreat here because after I'm gone, you guys are going to carry on. And I don't know how much he really said that to the disciples, but... He takes them off on a treat. He's got to get them completely away from the crowds, completely away from everything. But why do you suppose he chose Caesarea Philippi? Was it just some random place? I don't think so. It's kind of like the, uh, the, the, the League of Nations or something like that. It's uh, this Caesarea Philippi. It's in the territory of Dan, which I don't know if you remember Sunday school when the 12 tribes went into uh, Israel and they divided it up into the 12 tribes. Dan was the northernmost tribe and it included this area of, um, of Israel. So way up there north, north of the Sea of Galilee uh, where the Jordan River starts, up, there's mountains up there. And that's where, uh, that's 
the territory of Dan. Now, the territory of Dan at the time uh, of Joshua and David, um, that it was included. There were Jews living there at that time. Um, that long since uh, the Jews have long since not lived there anymore, because as you know. If you remember when we were reading this story, the northern kingdom falls a long time before the southern kingdom, right? You kind of remember that? The northern kingdom falls. Some of them are carried off. Some of them stay there. But basically, this area, this whole area in the north come, becomes not Jewish anymore. So what happened before the Israelites ever came there was there was a lot of Baal worship there. there was, we, we, in archaeology, we found at least 14 different Baal temples in this area. And at the time of Jesus, there were still some remnants of these, these uh, uh, Syrian temples to worship Baal. Um, and also, this is the, um, this is the place where um, the Greek god Pan, or Pan, it's not bread, I said, I said, I've said that before, but the Greek god Pan, the god of nature, there was a big temple uh, there. And you can see there's a big... Um, cave in the wall there, um, and there's a, there's, a, there's a very large kind of a shaft that goes down, and you can't really see the bottom of it, and that's where the water comes out that feeds, there's a, there's a deep spring there, and that feeds the, um, the Jordan River, and the, the, the Greeks believed that this god of nature, they had a big temple there, believed that the god of nature was giving life to the world through the spring. They had a big temple there. Um, also, just only a few years before Jesus and the disciples show up here, um, Philip, the Tetrarch, after Herod the Great dies, the, the, the whole territory is divided up into four. Philip gets one of the territories, including this area, and he decides that he wants to honor the, the new Caesar, and he wants to, you know, kind of establish his, his territory. So he builds a great white uh, temple to the deity of Caesar, and then he, he cleans up the town a little bit, and he renames the town. It used to be called pa Pania, or something like that. He, re he renames it Caesar Philippi, or Caesarea Philippi, after Caesar and himself. So think about this. You've got, you've got the Syrian gods, you've got the um, Greek gods, you've got Roman gods, and you've got the Jewish history all in this one place here. And that's where Jesus decides to take his disciples on their little retreat. And he asks them, who do people say that I am? Now, this is a good context to do that because basically it's like, you know, it's almost like a religious uh, supermarket. You can pretty much get any religion you want there. And Jesus is saying, who do people say that I am? And it's interesting, in the Greek, it doesn't say that he asked them once. It says that he asked them repeatedly. So this is their kind of their opening exercise for their retreat. You know how they, you have icebreakers and things like that? Well, he has this little, I guess, game that he starts out. He said, well, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am? Okay, they said that and that and that. And what else did they say? This is their kind of opening exercise for their retreat. And then they get to the main point. But, but before that, you know, he's asking them repeatedly, doesn't it kind of make you think about things that have happened in, in Israel history? You remember what Moses said right after he got the law to the people? He said, today, this day, I set before you life and death. Choose life. And Joshua, after they come into the promised land, he says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable for you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So Jesus is saying this is kind of one of those kinds of moments here. This is a mo moment where there's all these other gods around here. There's all these other religions. There's all these other ways to understand how the world works and how we should live. There's all of that. What are people saying about who I am to them? So the world and the flesh are saying that, you know, 
Jesus, uh, some people are saying you're John the Baptist reincarnated. Some of you are saying they're Elijah. Some people are saying Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, we Christians say, well, you know, they didn't really get it. He's saying John the Baptist, Elijah, all of these great prophets, right? And we know Jesus is more than that. But, but for the people, if Jesus is a human being that they can see and touch, he can't be any more than a super great prophet. To make the jump to say Jesus is the Son of God was too big for them. It's still to this day, the, the Muslims and the Jews say God can't become a human being. It's impossible. It's, it's too, the, a human being's body is too small, too limited to contain the creator of the universe. So it, it just can't, they, it doesn't compute. They can't understand it. But they're being very generous. I mean, the, the, these are pretty good answers. They're, they're choosing the, the best labels, the best prophets they can think of to say that must be who Jesus is. But they're still not enough. There's a whole other problem with this, and that's one of the reasons why Jesus took them on this retreat away from the crowds. And we've talked about this before, too. The crowds want to make Jesus king. Why? Because he gives them bread. He heals their sick. He's giving them good things. And why do you follow a God? You follow a God so that your crops grow and your children are healthy, and that's why you follow gods, right? In Japan, when people go to the temples on New Year's Day to... to um, or the shrine to, to pray. They're basically praying for prosperity and for good health for the new year. We often, even in Christian area, that's what we pray for, the new year, right? We pray for God to give us good stuff and keep bad stuff away from us. And almost all religion is to try to figure out how to do that, how to figure out how to get the good stuff from God and have God protect us from the bad stuff. That's what the people want. They want the God that they heard the stories about in the Old Testament, about bringing them out of slavery and taking them into the land of plenty and giving them a, a country and a long time of peace. They want that to happen again. And they want their Messiah to do that for them. And they think Jesus is the one who's going to take them that direction. But Jesus says, that's not my way. You guys don't understand what God is about. So that's a whole other problem. God didn't come to this earth to make our lives easier. God didn't come to make, to even to protect us from the bad things. God came to earth to give us his life. And eventually to rescue everything from all of the bad stuff. But in the meanwhile, the bad stuff and the good stuff are all around us. The world around us, even today, what does the world say about who Jesus is? Jesus was a great teacher. Jesus was a great man. Jesus was a great moral teacher. Someone to emulate, someone to follow. Not as God, but as someone who teaches us the best way to live. We put him up there with, with Gandhi or Mother Teresa or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or other great leaders, great teachers. Helen Keller. Jesus is like one of them. Somehow special, but... He's a great moral teacher. Some might even go far, so far as to say, and the Muslims and the Jews say this, that Jesus was a prophet. Jesus was someone who could speak on behalf of God. They, they believe that far. Just like the people at the time of Jesus. These are good answers, but they're not quite right. They're not who he really is. But what we have, this is the most important point. If you, if you don't get anything else I'm saying, this is, well, this is one of the most important points. We can't get there from here. Us as human beings, we are not capable of believing that a human being can be God. We, we can kind of intellectually believe it, but to really know it, to really know God through a human being is not something we are capable of. That's why something like this has to happen. The Father has to reveal Jesus to Peter. When Peter says, you are, you are the son of God, what does he say? We haven't gotten there yet. When Jesus says, you are the son of God, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. 
That's not something that Peter could have understood on his own. It's something that had to be given to him by God. And the same is true for all of us. We have to have these things revealed to us by God. They're not something we can learn. They're not something we can discover. We can say we believe them, but they have to be revealed to us before they really can transform us. So the Father reveals the truth. Peter says who he believes God is. He says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now this goes way beyond what the crowds are saying. The Son of the living God would be a very radical confession. I mean, think about it. It, was, it would be like any of us saying that any human being that we knew was God. I mean, think about that. Don't you think people around you would think you were crazy? Even someone who seems very special, who seems very different, to say that someone who looks like a human being, who smells like a human being, who feels like a human being, is the Son of God would be a very radical idea, especially for people whose religion says there is only one God. How, how can this be? It has to be something that God has revealed to Peter. Now notice that he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He doesn't say, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This isn't a confession. When, when, we, when we have communion, we, read, we start out and we read all these, I believe this, I believe that. We're confessing our faith, but this is stronger than a confession. He also doesn't say his opinion. He doesn't say, well, all those other people think this, but I think you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He doesn't say that either. He doesn't say, I, I reasoned it out with my mind, and I've come to the intellectual conclusion that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. No, he says something that comes straight from his heart. And there's no I think, there's no I believe, there's just a you absolutely are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Like I said before, we are not bright enough to figure God out. We're not bright enough to change our own thinking about things that are important. And this, this, is, this is one of the reasons why we have such a hard time changing our, our filters. Because a lot of us, we've been educated, we've, we've done fairly well in the world, and, and we think we have a lot of things figured out. We think we understand how things work. And so we somehow have raised ourselves up to the point where we believe we can judge when other people do things to us. We, we can judge whether that makes us happy or sad. And we think it's because of them, and we think it's because we've figured these things out. All of that, we think we know how to do these things, is blocking what God wants to reveal to us. Blocking what God wants to show us. We have to come to the end of ourselves like, we, like, like we've talked about before. God can reveal to us who Jesus is in our hearts, but we have to be open to it. We have to be willing to let go of anything that's different from what God reveals to us. So was Peter transformed in this instance? Was Peter suddenly this great man of God who followed Jesus perfectly from this point on? No. In fact, if you read a few verses down, he rebukes Jesus. Jesus tells him, Jesus tells the disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die on a cross. And Peter says, no, it shall never happen to you. And takes Jesus aside and starts telling him, no, it, that can't happen. And then Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. So Peter is not completely transformed at this moment. He has the knowledge, the personal knowledge in his heart of who Jesus is. The Father has showed him who Jesus is, but there's still some things to work out. And that's why we say this is a journey. That's why we say that this is a step-by-step, little-by-little process. Think what's going to happen a few weeks from now when they get to Jerusalem and Jesus is arrested and taken to his trial. Peter kind of follows, and then he denies Jesus, he denies that he knows Jesus three times. The, the revelation isn't complete yet. He's not 
completely transformed yet, just like none of us are. The truths of God, though, cannot be discovered by human means. We can study as much as we want to. We can listen to as many sermons as we want to. We can do all kinds of things, read books. We can even be reading the Bible trying to get ourselves transformed. But it's not until we kind of let go of trying to change ourselves and let God reveal himself to us that we're really transformed. Also, another thing that we can't get away from is that the the truth about Jesus Christ always includes the cross. And it's something that I think in Christianity we kind of skip over the cross stuff. But if we're followers of Jesus, we're going to have to go through the same kinds of things that he went through. The cross is about giving up all rights to yourself. The cross is about giving up even your own life. It's not that, we're, that we have to go find somewhere to die somewhere, but it's that we have to let go of any rights we have if we want to continue following Jesus on this path and continue having the Father reveal him to us. Now, Peter resisted this at first. But if you read, if you keep reading through Acts, little by little, God kept revealing things to him, and Peter was the one who held the keys of the kingdom in the beginning. Peter is the one who preached the very first Christian sermon on Acts, uh, in Acts chapter 2. And all the Jews became Christians, 3,000 of them. And then in Acts chapter 10, Peter was there the first time that Gentiles, non-Jews, became Christians, became followers of Jesus. And God was revealing to him Jesus through this process, and he was growing up in what God was leading him in. So how do we learn to to listen to God? It's about recognizing what we have learned that is not from Him. We have to understand that what we believe we know about morality and theology and all of these other things, all the things that we've learned, they may or may not be the way that God looks at things. We have to be willing to hold all of those things loosely and allow Him to reveal things to us that might displace some of those or a lot of those things. I started to really learn this uh, uh, when I went to mission trips, going to Belize and to Mexico. And I kept, I kept wondering, you know, I'm an educated person. I've studied the Bible my whole life. You know, I've grown up relatively, uh, um, um, you know, easy, easy life and, and had an opportunity to do a lot of education. I felt like my faith was growing. And the first time I went on a mission trip, I kind of felt like I, I must be better than, than them somehow, and I'm taking God to them. But I always found that God was already there. And I also found people who had a faith that was so much stronger and deeper than mine. And it didn't make any sense to me at first. I used to wonder how children and mothers in utterly poor situations, some of them who had no education at all, had such a deep and beautiful faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It was, it was amazing to me. How could they know Jesus so well and love him so much when they hadn't learned all of the things that I had learned? Paul knows about that. You know, the Apostle Paul, right? He learned... He, he was at the top of his class. He learned all that there was to learn. He, he was basically perfect in his religion. And then he met Jesus. And it wasn't very long before he said, I count all of that rubbish. Because now I know Jesus, I don't need any of that stuff. And these people that I met in Belize or in Mexico, I think they had the same attitude. Yeah, it would be nice if I had a house that didn't leak whenever it rained or where we didn't have to cook and live and sleep all in the same room. But that doesn't really matter that much to me because Jesus is there. Jesus is with me. Jesus is beautiful. And that I even have an opportunity to live on this planet and raise my children is enough for me. So after I come back from that, of course, what do I think? I think what a lot of you probably think. I have to change myself. I have to change my attitude. I have to try harder. I need to read the right books or 
I have to work harder to become more like they are because they have something that I don't have. But education is not the way to get there. Reading books, listening to things, it's not the way to get there. We have to let go of that. I think that's kind of what this whole binding and loosing thing is about. We've tried to make that about what the church is, but I think Jesus is talking directly to Peter. What you hold on to, that's going to be held on to. What you let go of, that's going to be let go of. Here's a, di- here's a different way to look at all this. Where do we get our values from? How do we know what's important and what isn't? How do we know what's right and what's wrong? We don't all agree on these things, right? We all have different values. We have different, even though we think right and wrong are absolute, each of us has a different idea about what's right and what's wrong. Where do we get these ideas from? Where did we learn these things? We got them from our family, we got them from our cultures, we got them from our religious environments, we got them from writers and speakers and movies and music and friends and school. That's where we got them from. We may have even got them from the Bible. That should be the best way, right? If we get it from the Bible, then, then we're really right. Then we really know that we've got it. But what do people fight over more than anything else in religion, what the Bible actually says about some things. We can only get our values and our filters and our thinking from God. Either we're choosing it or we're letting go and letting God reveal it to us, step by step as he knows we need it. God is not looking for us to get better, to learn more, God is looking for us to go through the cross and let go of all those things so that he can reveal himself to us. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you do desire to reveal yourself to us, to reveal who you are to us. And from what little we have seen, God, we know that you are more beautiful, more amazing, more fulfilling, more satisfying than anything else we have pursued But still, we get caught up in all of the thinking of the world around us, everything that we have learned. And we don't leave a lot of space for you to reveal yourself to us. God, help us each day to be looking for how we can let go of things and let you reveal yourself more to us so that we might shine your light in this world. In the name of Jesus, we pray.